Hey, hey, everybody. It's Karen Hutton. Hi. Today's our Friday Live series. How about that for an intro, huh? 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 Just telling you. So uh, I'm. we're going live today. So today uh, I'm having my good friend Kenneth Hines on today, and it's an Ask Me Anything Friday. I've got some thoughts, but I'll hold on to them. So while everybody's coming in, um, looks like Professor Hines is in the house. Oh my God, he's requesting to come in here. I'm so excited. Okay. <laughs> oh, I just love being an idiot. There he is. He'll be here momentarily. Professor Hines is in the house. <laughs> Karen Hutton, how are you? I'm fine, except my earbuds aren't working. Can you hear me okay? I can. That's fantastic. Because <laughs> I'm really irritated with tech right now because it's just like, I don't know. I don't know. I have a friend who used to have this really funny s statement when things didn't work. She was a singer. She was very expressive. And I won't tell you what she said. I probably should. I need, I need a glass <laughs> of wine to tell you what she said. But anyway, it's sort of frustrating. So how is Professor Hines today? I have one quick announcement once a few more people get in here. Um, just warning you that I'll do that before we really launch. But how are you? I'm great. I'm doing great. I know you're great, but how are you? I know what you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been tired lately. Um, it's been a lot going on. Of course, remember I said you'll be the first person to have a live with my new background, and you I are. I love it. I know. I saw it when you <laughs> popped in here. I'm like, oh, my God. It's yeah, I'm gorgeous. a little in the dark, though, because I have some lights over there, but they're not really shining on me, but I'll fix it. <laughs> we'll have the center spot. You'll have a, a, a flood. We call that a yeah. little flood. So before we launch in here, this welcome, welcome, everybody who's coming in. I just want to tell you that um, this today... Our theme, I love having themes. I need to focus, otherwise I'm all over the place, is Ask Me Anything, and that's both of us. Um, actually, Kenneth, I have a couple questions for you, you know? Because you know how there's always a lull, right? So I've got, I got a couple questions for you, so. Just <laughs> warning you. Um, but I also wanted to let people know that um, I have a new, or just launched, just today, launched a brand new look on my website, and I'm like, <laughs> really excited and then we did it and then i was like oh my god let's have a sale so i have a 30 percent off sale uh off the fine prints on my website going on i've actually got to post a uh comment because it'll have the discount code in it oh and it's not going to paste now don't you love it sorry I know. Oh, there I you go. That. I You're go back. Now. Yeah, I'm back. So basically, I, um, I'm put. I'm going to pin this comment because I'm doing a 30% off sale. Just totally impromptu. Like we decided to do this right before this live off fine prints. Um, the link is in my bio and the discount code is, I always have to look. I've got enough notes because I have notes for you too, right here. Um, mm -hmm. New look 30. And I did a little preview in my stories today, so you can kind of see what, what I got going on, um, which is also new merchandise, new merch area that I didn't have Ooh. before. So the discount goes to the prints, but the new merch, man, it's, well, it's just so inexpensive that I was like, yeah, let's just do that. So check that out, gift guide on the site. Just check it out. I think it's awesome. I'm excited and I'm a dork when I'm excited, so sorry. Um, I'm not sorry, not sorry. Isn't that sorry slash not sorry? <laughs> Ugh, my phone keeps dimming. I don't know why it's dimming when I'm on a oh live. That's going to annoy me. Do you need to reboot? <laughs> no, well, I'm going to see if I can. So my, my video might free because I'm going to set my thing to not turn to dim on me. So let's see. Is that your thing? It's your thing. Set it how you want to do. It won't dim. If you tell it not to, I made that up. All right, now we're we're fixed. <laughs> are we are we cooking with gas now? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. 
fantastic. So yeah, everybody jumping in here, this today's topic is Ask Me Anything because you know why I do that? Because Professor Hines is one of these multidisciplinary guys who always just, he just always has interesting thoughts and people ask questions and you always learn a lot when you ask questions and he's like the perfect person to do it with. And um, so you are celebrating a new look in your studio. So give, <laughs> us, a, give us a tour. Yeah, so this is, um, cause remember I think last week, um, if for people that, that watch my Ask the Professor that I do on Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. This was not here. None of this was here. And uh, so I'm going to, so you kind of see, I have all those prints over there. Chicago. Oh. Um, it's, so that's a 20 by 40 on the, the thin panels. The thin panel, 20 by 40. And then the big ones are 40 by 60s. That's you know, a lot larger than I expected them to be. I know, they're really big. And oh, part. let me turn the lights on those are new um so that's um this is actually an oil pastel digital oil Ooh. pastel in the back nice and that i did that in photoshop so then of course people know the um aerial stuff that i did recently with the helicopter tour with fly nyan Ellis, i saw that and i was like ah oh, oh. So that's yeah. a 20 by 40 then uh waterfall in tennessee is a 20 by 40 and then, of course, which is now closed, the vessel closed once again. It closed yesterday uh, due to another tragic accident of another uh, suicide. So um, it's going to be closed more than likely for good. It will not open back up. So After all that, they're going to close it. Because it's only been open for um, two months. <laughs> I know, but it, it, when I say all that, it costs a bundle to build something like that and then all the lead up to it and... Oh, that's so sad. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, so that has been my wonderful festivities lately. Awesome. So for the Ask Me Anything, and there is producer Steph is in the house. I remember that's her, producer that Steph. name from when you oh. did your mm -hmm. uh, website uh, Coco sale. Ots. Tomorrow's her birthday. So everybody, everybody wish Coco Ots happy birthday. A day early, she'll love it. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday to you. Happy she, birthday. She's a day before the best month of the year, though. <laughs> day before the best month of the year? Yeah, August. Is that your birthday? Yeah, my birthday's in August. <laughs> when is it? 28th. <gasps> One of my best friends is the 26th. Hmm. But it's a, so then, does that make you a, a Virgo or a Leo? Virgo, the better sign. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> Me too. In fact, I think I'm just a little over a week after, like a week and a half after you, Ooh. which is great. Um, so, so in terms of ask me anything, I know you're all sitting here going, what should we ask? Okay, I'll tell you, you can ask about gear. You can ask about, what else did I write down? Photography. You can write, ask about our journey. You can ask about printing. You can ask anything. So I have a question for you. Yeah, go for it. Because I was, I was thinking about questions. I was, and then somebody asked me this once and I thought, oh, that's a really smart question. It's this, what one question does no one ever ask you in an interview or whatever? that you wish they would? I don't do a lot of these, so I really don't have any questions. People don't ask you questions? Well, because I don't do interviews. <laughs> but don't people ask you questions when you like, you know, appear and do other kinds of things? Well, like when I do the lives here on Instagram, you know, people ask questions then, but I, I will say, I don't think I've ever gotten a question. Well, I would say, I'm sure there's a lot of me outside of photography that people don't know. Because like people usually don't know how old I really am, how, how long I- how, how old are you really? So I'm 30. But I've been doing photography for 21 years and that always confuses people. Yeah. Uh, when they try to guess that. Um, so, there, <laughs> so I would say, like, if it was 
questions that I'm usually asked often but don't like, that would be easier <laughs> for sure. All right. What question? Okay. That's a good question. What questions are you asked often that you don't like? I hate when people ask me what gear should they buy and then they'll send me a list of stuff and say, should I buy this? I don't know. Should you buy it? Like, I hate those questions. I really do. Those are my, and I read a lot of them here on Instagram and sometimes I'll just skip over them. It's not to be rude or anything like that, but it's like, I, I can't, I can't decide that for you. So I don't know why people continuously will ask me gear questions like that. Cause I don't, I, I don't care for those questions. Now, if someone asks something about, like if they've done their homework, they know what they want and they know what they're photographing and they come to me and say, okay, this is what I'm looking at. This is what I want to use this equipment for. What is the better route to go? That's a better question because it's sort of like I can give, uh, you know, a question that's not just some kind of general response to a gear yeah. question. Because it's context. You mean you so, need context. It's, it's sort of like any more, you don't just, there isn't, there's no such thing as the best camera. It's really, it's, it's, it's so granular now. You just decide what you want and then. So I, I hate that question. And then I, I hate getting asked the question, uh, what camera do I use? Because it's posted on every single Instagram image I share and has been that way for <laughs> over. I think I've been on Instagram for like nine years. Every oh. image that I have ever shared, this is listed. I've gotten questions where people will ask, oh, what Canon did you photograph this with? And they'll send me the picture too of what they're in reference to. I kid you not, I've gotten that too. But my bio specifically says my partner is Sony. And even in the post of the of the of what people send me, sometimes I'll put it early enough to where when they send the post, it's right there in the sort of overview. Yeah. So it says it, but people still ask the question of what camera do you use? And I hate those questions. I'm like, if people just I think that's usually my biggest pet peeve. A lot of people will ask questions that they can go on my website and find out because yeah, I put everything I, there. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody does that. That's, that's the last game a lot. You know what I'm curious about, which isn't about you specifically. I'm curious to know where everybody's from. I'm always <laughs> curious about that. Unless, unless we're like, you know, rushing, rushing, rushing. Uh, I love to, I love to hear where's everybody from? Where's everybody today? And what are you drinking? Like you should be drinking your fluids. See, so me, I got mine. Of course, got to advertise Lightroom. Get cool. Adobe Lightroom. Naturally, <laughs> Kansas. Hello, Kansas, LA. Is that LA, uh, Los Angeles or Louisiana? I'm never New sure. New York City, San Antonio. San Antonio. New York is where I'm in Atlanta temporarily for the India! next. India. <laughs> oh, there is someone from Atlanta. Yeah. Georgia. Wow, there's a lot of people from Georgia. Wow. Dallas. Sparkling water, good for you. Drink your fluids, people. It it hydrates your brain. And believe me, from what I'm seeing in the world today, people need to hydrate their brain much more than they are. St. Louis, Florida, South Africa. Oh my God. What time is it in South Africa? Cape Cod. What time is it in South Africa? Are you up all night? What is the deal? Now I'm worried about your sleep. Are you hydrated? Are you resting? Got just... London. What do you guys like to shoot the most? Portrait, landscape, or street? Landscape. I it's even for landscape and street for me. Those I I like anything that doesn't deal with people. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I... Yeah. So those are definitely my my favorites. I love. I like landscapes because it's, um, you know, I go back and forth as far as oh, I want to do more street now or, you know, I have the times where, oh, I want to focus more on landscapes. So like the pandemic has placed me in, I want to do more landscapes. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, please tell us about, all right, the question is, please tell us about your favorite tour that you hope to dive in again or reschedule it. Oh. <gasps> 
Ooh, you go first. Favorite tour. I'm going to get ready to write some of these down. Coming fast. I hope to dive in again. I don't. I don't know. I don't have any, actually. <laughs> Maybe it's time you got one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 16. Oh, it's 16 in South Africa. That means it's 12, 16 in the morning. I guess that's what that means. Maybe you should go to bed. Uh, but stay up for this and then go to bed. How about that? Oh, yeah, 12, um, 16. Then. Yeah. Okay. So my favorite tour so far uh, was the um, Artist Voice Venice and the Italian Dolomites that we did in 2019. Uh, loved it. Can't wait to do it again. And the other place is um, Slovenia. Oh. I was planning it for, I was actually planning it for this year. In 2019, I was planning it for this year. Now we'll just have to wait and see. So, yep. um, yeah, that's what I hope to dive in again. Uh, or at the very least, just go myself. But I like bringing people. I love, I love sharing these adventures and um, yeah, and doing the whole artist voice thing is really fun because we make it an event. See, basically my whole theory with the artist voice adventures and retreats is I make it an event I would want to attend. And I have really high standards because I'm a Virgo. Kenneth knows how this goes. Absolutely. And, uh, and yeah, so basically, and I think being a really good photographer means being able to tell an incredible visual story and the, and the more fun you're having and the better nourished you are and the more you're hiking and seeing lots of different things and moving around and thinking lots of, you know, getting your brain firing in a lot of different ways uh, wakes up a, a certain type of, you know, creativity and being able to respond. So we have all these different kinds of experiences and incredible food and we stay in places where we can be comfortable and get enough sleep. And it's very different than a lot of what a lot of other people do. Um, because I don't, I find exhausted people can't be super creative. <laughs> my opinion so that's what i'm hoping to get back to i may even i'm thinking about how to do this online and that that might be a fourth quarter thing that i do we're kind of kicking it around right now kicking it around like a kickball so when are you going to start doing yours mister what tours yeah workshops and stuff you're already starting to speak right uh well they're still virtual but I, as of right now, I have no plans on honestly not doing any tours. Uh, you wanna, any... Well, well, tours could be um, also, you know, teaching. It isn't just leading people. It could be teaching, too. You're such a good teacher. I have enjoyed my time working with Adobe in producing tutorial content for the Lightroom app itself. And then uh, we've done... Uh, we did a, a partnership with Photo Plus back in April, which was really, really good. Um, I did one with B&H as well. So I've enjoyed doing those kind of speaking events. The only in-person that I've done in a year and a half was last month with Zeiss and Focus Camera in Brooklyn, New York. And I enjoyed that because, you know, it's been a year and a half ever since I not done anything in person the last thing that I did was WPPI last year uh -huh. and because my business had always been a hybrid of in person and online when the pandemic took place you know it didn't really affect me much at all and I'm like well if I can still do the same amount of work and still kind of keep things the same as before but I don't even have to leave home why put as much emphasis to go back out um, as before. So I've kind of just been keeping to working online because it's less work to do. You know, I don't have to travel as much, even though I've kind of been picking back up, still not to my old schedule. But um, I've, I've enjoyed just being able to be in here, you know, working on my pet project of renovating and and uh, putting up light fixtures, learning how to do that sort of stuff. And That's awesome. And, I love um, your people do and it's such an interesting it's usually usually it's a hypothetical question but you know if you didn't have this what would you do like in our case you know if you couldn't go travel what would you be doing and so to find out you know well I actually really like installing my light fixtures or I learned how to play the piano or whatever I think that's really interesting 
See, somebody already wants a, a workshop from you in New York. That would be the easiest thing in the world for you to do. It really would. I think people so, would love it. I think they would get so much out of it. You have so much to offer. Just saying. So I still do the one-on-ones. I don't do groups anymore, um, but I still do one-on-one -on -one workshops in New York. And that's the only city, too, because I used to do other cities, Chicago, D.C., but I just stay to New York for any workshops now. Because yeah. I'm trying to just, if I do anything, it's just going to be in one location. So people have to come to New York to do them. Yeah. Um, and funny, someone asked me already in an email about a workshop for February of next year. So I think it's funny that a lot of people seem to be going around that February time frame for next year. Right. I'm seeing. Okay. There's just a couple any other questions? Yeah. Any other questions? One-on-one -on -one is perfect. There you go. There you go. 2022. Okay, okay. There is a question. How do you choose? This is not, I don't have an answer for this. Okay. I, suppose, I suppose I do. This is really more your bailiwick. How do you choose good lighting for an outdoor portrait shoot? Um, it takes, it's a, it's a lot of factors as far as what kind of look you want to go for. So the time of day is important. Don't ever shoot during the middle of the day if you don't have any kind of shade or something to block the sun. And you especially don't want to photograph a model or subject where the sun is behind you, the photographer, and it's aimed directly in their face because it's going to cause them to, you know, kind of squint their eyes. So that's why sunrise or sunset is the best time to do any kind of outdoor portraits unless you have a, a big, like, you know, reflector or something um, a nice little, you know, big studio setup that's set up outdoors where you're still capturing the natural light, but then you're kind of filtering that harsh light out. Um, so it, you kind of have to think of it that way. You know, do you want to backlight your subject? Uh, because that can become tricky also, depending on, you know, are you trying to achieve a silhouette look or are you more focused on your subject itself and they just happen to be backlit? Because sometimes what I see a lot of people do is when a subject is backlit, they'll sometimes make the mistake to underexpose the shot in order to keep the highlights that's behind the subject. So say if you have, you know, some nice clouds or something behind that subject, most have the tendency to underexpose and in certain situations, it really depends on the light. There's no specifics to it, but it really depends on the light. You don't want to underexpose portraits because when you do that and you use post-processing to bring up the shadows on people's faces, you're introducing noise and it breaks up the skin. So that's why that's not a good thing to do. So in that situation, you know, if you want to have a fill light, you know, if you want to have a soft box or something like that in front, while your subject is still backlit, you know, you can do that too. And, you know, lower your uh, exposure and then have that fill light have the power that you need so that way you're not getting the, that shadow area on your subject because you're going to ruin your photo if you underexpose it purposefully and then try to use uh, editing software to bring it up because that's just going to kill your subject's uh, face. Yeah. You don't want to be doing all the processing on a face. <laughs> that would be a bad thing. Does that answer your question? I think so. That's actually really good. Even, you know, like, even if you're not a photographer, but you're somebody who's going to be photographed, you know, you want to think about these things and, you know, don't let somebody put you in the sun where you're squinting or have those, you know, where the light creates a big shadow over your eyeball so you can't see your eyes and, you know, I found I you know even before I really did photography professionally, I found people doing all kinds of funny things with portraits and just not getting the lighting right. It's the front wash, you know, that <laughs> fills everything in that you that's ideal, I think. And that's what's so nice about morning and evening is that it's um, the ambient light is a lot softer and kind of fills yeah. in all the nooks and crannies. Yeah, I know for some people they. I've I've had many photographers that say, oh, it's easier to photograph people that are light skin or it's easier to photograph people that are dark skin. And I've never really had one that has ever been, you know, that I found to be easier than others. 
uh, but definitely lighter skin, you have a higher tendency to overexpose in right. that situation also. But, you know, yeah, if you, everything about photography is about lighting. That's it. When you master the lighting, you can photograph anything. It, that, that applies to portraits, that applies to landscapes. The lighting is what makes the photo because I mentioned in a, a live some weeks ago where there was a comment on one of my images from Seattle and someone left a comment that said, this doesn't look like your regular photo. And I said, yeah, because it's a vacation photo. It's not a actual like planned out photography, you know, tour or something like that. I said, this is a vacation image. Be and why is that a difference? I said, vacation photos, they're taken at any time of the day. But professional photos, they're strategic in when they're taken because the way that you, my colors, every, every picture behind me has something in common. They were all taken at exactly the same time of day. That's why my colors are always, you know, there's always a base to my images and that's something that is, that will be true for every photo that I take. Because either sunrise or sunset, you get that nice, warm sunlight color that's very soft. And that's where my colors come from. During the day, because that bright sunlight washes out colors, I can't pull these same colors out from images that are taken in the middle of the day. So that's why the image that people saw that might not have looked like this, because you can't pull these same colors from a photo that's taken at two o'clock in the afternoon. That's the difference. So people never really noticed that because I always did it every time. So to see something outside of that just throws people off. But that's the difference. A vacation photo is going to be different from a professional photo. Right. So true. And it should be, you know? I mean, <laughs> real life has to look like real life once in a while. You know what I'm saying? Um, so everybody who's, I, I've been watching people come in here while uh, Kenneth has been talking. And so we are doing the Ask Me Anything. So you can ask either one of us anything about photography, about our journey, about gear, about whatever. Um, I also wanted to let newcomers know, just in honor of a, a new look that we launched on my site today, I'm doing a 30% off fine prints on my site, which is in my link bio. You can go check it out. 30% um, off the link or the, the code is is pinned in the comments and uh, new look 30. It is. So go check it out. Um, do you know the book, the street photography manual from David Gibson? I do not. If so, do you like it? It's my, it's my bed lecture since yesterday. I love that. Do you know that book? I do not. I see we're going to have to meet, uh, make some uh, notes here today, <laughs> add to our reading list. Greetings from Cali, Colombia. Hello, it's probably Cali, probably saying that wrong. Hello from Colombia. I've been seeing all kinds of earthquakes from South America lately. Uh, are, is it happening in Colombia too? That's been just unnerving. As originally a California native, I hate earthquakes. I grew up with them. Oh, I just really don't like them. <laughs> So, and, and producer Steph is in uh, Costa Rica and they had a big one down there Ooh. nearby. She made a run for it out of her house. Oh, he'll bring his copy to New York and show it to you during your one-on-one -on -one workshop that we have now scheduled for you. <laughs> DM, him for, DM him for details, get him pinned down to the calendar. Okay. <laughs> so professor, what's, uh, what's the next landscape like? You're kind of known for New York, your New York images, and also more and more now talking for Adobe and kind of being an expert on all things photography. So when you make your landscape trips, are they mainly for your fine art? Are they for fun? Are they um, like, why do you do your landscapes? What are they for? And what's your next bucket list location? And I'm going to write some of these other questions down too. They are usually uh, for my photography and for fine art sales. That's usually what I go in with the, the thought process behind. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's, since for a lot of these projects, there's only one that I did a few months ago that was a sponsored trip. 
And it was a trip that I did with Zeiss. And they actually paid for me to be on the road going to all these places and taking pictures with their Otis lenses with the new Alpha One. Other trips outside of that, I, I'm spending my own money up front. But I like to recoup, you know, the money that I've spent on my trips by um, the images that I take on those trips. So it comes in the form of it's it sometimes a lot of times in, indirect as far as where my payback comes from those trips. So it can be from either sales of prints, uh, which isn't as high as some other uh, areas of where I sell the most, such as my presets for Adobe. Um, I have my images available for licensing. So that's how if you, you know, just like how it's on Lightroom, I have images that are in Best Buy, um, other people that have licensed my images. So that's where my architecture and fine art images really get utilized a lot. And street street photography is indirect because I don't make money off of the images themselves. They're off of the edits for those images. So my store is actually a big part of what I do in selling the presets and, and doing the teaching. So I teach off of the images I do for street. And because most people know me for that, it's why that's that's probably the biggest income that I have as far as doing street photography. You know, I spend my own money, but then the I get it paid back from what I do in terms of selling the edits for any new images and having that available in my store, teaching street photography, how I do it, and then also being invited to speak, you know, how I did B&H, Adobe, that sort of thing. So that's kind of how it's broken up. Each genre generally has something very different. You know, the landscape stuff is, it's kind of like in line with what you do on the Fuji side and kind of like where you're, you know, you have projects that are commissioned sometimes to, to go out and you're, you know, using uh, either new products that they have and you're out on location for that type of project. That's where the landscape stuff usually is specifically. That's going to be stuff that is uh, with a particular company or, or my focus is to sell it. Because any image that I, I take or, or want to capture when it's a landscape, I want it to be like this that's behind me. That's my thought process. Right. I want this to be print. So that's where my first and foremost sort of thought process goes. I have to take the best photo that I can. And there's a place um, that I went to back in April when I was uh, working with Zeiss to Ricketts Glen State Park, which is in Phil uh, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. It's outside of Philadelphia. And we went and spent hours out there and the conditions were not perfect. So I didn't take any pictures. I said, I can't take a photo. It's, I, I know what I want and I saw what I wanted in my mind. This is not it. So I, I spent, I hiked four miles in one day and took zero pictures because this wasn't what I wanted. It, the conditions were not right. So I had to go back the next day. And I only took two pictures. That's it. I only took two pictures. And I was like, okay, we're done. I know I got it now because the conditions were perfect the next day. And I'm, you know, people will think I'm crazy, but I'm like, I know what I want. So like this picture, right there. This was one that I took in Tennessee last year. This was, I think this was actually a pandemic trip as well. So my friend Dave took me down to this waterfall. It's actually kind of difficult to get to. You have to go down a cable trail. And so you're like hiking down into like a canyon. I saw this shot before I took it. So I set up everything. I took two pictures and I looked at Dave and I said, we can go. He was like, you're done? I was like, yeah, I'm done. I don't need anything. I got it. And we left. I was like, I know when I've gotten the shot and I know what looks good. And so that's, so that day I only took those two images and I took it, you know, I took a vertical and then I took a horizontal because, you know, in situations like this, sometimes the, the vertical shot works, other times the horizontal will. And that's all I need. I don't, I don't sit for hours I know exactly what I need. I know exactly what I want. Once I've gotten it, I don't need to take anything else. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. 
Okay, there's another question. Fave city for photography. Oh, I, I, I processed that as something, and I was like, wait a minute, what's the question? And then I reprocessed I'm like, oh, what's my favorite city for photography? Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely New York and Chicago. Those are my two favorites. Mine is big city Paris, and then like almost any little ancient village, but I have a, a, a love Grasse in the south of France mm. uh, for photography, just one of my faves. Um, I think I might have some new favorites coming up in Italy. I'll let you know. Lucky. Um, fan of Joe Greer. I don't know who Joe Greer is. I have no idea who that is either. Wow. We failed you on that one, Trey. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll live. Let's see. Then what was this question about? Somebody is okay. So I'm just about to buy a 55 millimeter Zeiss. Is it still worth it to buy? So going back to um, Karen, uh, when we were talking about questions, I don't like those questions either. And here's why. It's, it's more so when it's tied to cameras. Mm -hmm. So I'll answer that question first. Yes, it's still worth buying. A lot of people put age to determine the quality of products of, of any kind of gear, whether it's a camera or whether it's a lens. The age of, of, of equipment doesn't matter as what the type of images that you can produce with it are. So I had someone that, that left me a YouTube comment last week where they were using a, a, a Sony um, NEX6. And they said that they bought a Zeiss bodice lens and attached it to their camera. And they said they were amazed at the quality the of the images. Of equipment Sorry. Doesn't matter. <laughs> that was but, funny. Yeah. I thought but, I would try and answer some of these comments that I could, and I'm still listening to you, but my sound just went off. <laughs> but, um, you know, and that camera came out in 2011, 2010, 2011. So it's, um, definitely a decade old at the very least and but they put good glass on it and they're like wow like this camera is actually really good now but even though that camera is old he saw that that camera got better because he put better glass on it there are lenses that that i've used that are 30 40 50 years old and they still perform to this day if the glass is good glass doesn't matter 20 years from now these lenses are still going to be good lenses and you know even with cameras you know technology is always going to be changing as we've seen with sony they come out with new cameras like every week it seems like they just had one a couple days ago and a lot of people spend their time chasing the technology just use what you have use what's already in existence um i know people will say is it okay to buy a sony a7 ii today that camera came out in 2014 yes as long as you have good glass, it doesn't matter about the age of the camera. It's going to take good images. You know, if you want to buy an X-T2, that camera came out in like 2014, 15, somewhere around in that period. That is a great camera. My friend still shoots with that. And I'm like, how do your, your pictures look this good? And you haven't done anything because she's using good glass and it's a good camera. So it doesn't matter about the age. The 55, I still own it. It was the first Zeiss lens that I ever purchased when I went to Sony mirrorless for the full frame. And I still own it. I still shoot with it. Uh, this picture is shot with that lens. That's with the 55 um, Zeiss 1.8. And it's on the new Alpha 1. I first started using that lens on the original A7. And I'm still shooting with, with the new cameras today. So, you know, it doesn't matter about the age. If it's good glass, it's always going to be good glass. Yep. Here, 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 here. So we have a question. Do you print your own work or do you send it out? Oh, send it out. I definitely don't have a printer this size. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the investment that it, in time, not only time and energy, but money in having the kind of printers that will print like that. <laughs> yeah, no, you'd have to do it commercially to make it pay off. I send out as well. Who do you send yours to? Can you give a little shout out? So I am, so... These pictures behind me specifically are called exposure prints. Um, they are actually very thin, but they're they're very um, 
cost efficient because these are called exposures and they're from Bay Photo. Really love them. Been using them for years. Um, I also use White Wall. Um, they're very good. So any images that people purchase from my store come from White Wall. And um, our Artisan HD is another lab that, that does really, really good work as well. And then for when I do my books, those are a different company called Sale Design. Uh, so I have a kind of a plethora of co different companies, but these specifically um, are Bay Photo. The reason I get these is because, you know, if I turn the light on, notice how they don't reflect. That's why I have those specifically, is because when I'm doing anything with video and those are my backdrop, I don't want the reflections. So it's also, you know, these cost way less than what their permanent uh, finishes would be. So if I had this as a metal print in this size, this actually would be from White Wall about, I think this is maybe about a 4,000 plus image, $4,000 or something. It's because it would be in their master series, I think because of the size, I think the 40 by 60 and larger is where their master series is, are. And they're about at least $3,500, $4,000 or something like that. So that's why these are, the two big images are my, um, in my master series. So there's a limited quantity of, of these, but then that's why they're so expensive compared to everything else in my store. Right. Because they're really large and the finish is just the best quality that I could possibly find. And that's, that's you know, when I do my prints, I want the best, just the same way as I only shoot Zeiss. Uh, I want the best lenses. I want the best printing that I possibly can. And those labs are the best in my opinion. Yeah, so my on my website, my if you order online, it goes through Bay Photo, and mm. they're really just fantastic. And for me, all my custom, pretty much, I'm trying to think of an exception right now, none. All my custom work goes through Ogden Editions, which is a small uh, company I've worked with for years. Um, OgdenEditions.com, and they are just everything is hand done and beautiful and. In fact, we, we, in fact, as a matter of fact, my big uh, Cedar House, my ongoing Cedar House uh, Sport Hotel art installation, that latest, the build, first next building that we're doing is the shipment is on its way. So they should be arriving, I think, within the week. Oh, so, nice. And they're all big um, metal prints um, with a, kind of a satin finish. Suitable. Yeah, that's what these are. These are satin uh, yeah. finishes. Uh, yeah. These are the radiant. Specifically, these are the radiant um satin finish of the exposures what i had up here previously were the uh vivid satin exposure but these have uh, deeper blacks so they are more true to my actual images that's how you see them on your screen and what i see them you know you know in normal printing so their their colors are more accurate on this finish than they are the vivid finish because I wanted the colors to, to really show up in these. Right. Okay, next question is, in fact, I'm writing down, um, writing down one more. Uh, okay, so the next one is uh, photographer who uh, most inspired you. Could be more than one. Uh, so when I started, I had two. There's a Trey Ratcliffe and then a photographer by the name of Brian Krug, who is out of uh, Pennsylvania. So when I first started professionally back in 2008, 2009, I, I like their work for different reasons. I love Trey's work for what he produced of his travel work and doing HDR. That's how I originally started doing HDR early on in my career. And I just like, you know, his overall quality of images. They just looked really, really good to me. And then Brian Krug, I really liked because he could take the most simplest things and make them look gorgeous. And his unique colors were just beautiful because of his balance with the richness and vibrancy of certain colors in, in, uh, and that, paired with the, the contrast, I really liked. 
So that's, I, I took the two of their, their work and kind of combined that to create my own work. And so you kind of see a little bit of those two in, in the work that I produce. And I, I wanted to keep my images to where they were more natural. That's why what you see, people are very surprised that the unedited of my images are, you know, not that far off from the edited versions. And I try to keep that as much as possible. Because, you know, for me, I, I don't want it to be to where it has to be something that's concocted in a photo editing program. I want people to know this is what the scene looked like, but this is just, you know, me sort of exaggerating certain characteristics of, of that scene that I see or that specific composition. And um, so those are the two that, that starting out, that's where my work and style came from Stray Ratcliffe and Brian Krug. Yep. Mine was uh, since I started so long ago compared to you, <laughs> youngin. Uh, yeah, so mine was always Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, Minor White, who are not only pioneers, you know, with photography, especially with landscape, um, but also, you know, they shot black and white. I mean, Trying to think of an exception. Some of them did shoot color. I'm not saying they didn't shoot color, but black and white always informed me because you see, like, color is great. I mean, I love color. I'm a color freak, but color can also be a distraction to, can be a distraction to the underpinnings, the form of, of an image and what it is, what the, what the bones of the image really are. So, you know, when you look at West, and of course, when it came to printing, that was where I got my printing sensibilities too, because when you see the, 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 the darks and the lights, you know, there's 36 shades of black alone <laughs> in that exist. I mean, that's just a fact. I don't even know how many shades of gray or white or whatever, but it's fascinating because all these different shades, even though you think, Oh, it's black or it's white or maybe gray. No, there's many, many tones and shades and they all speak. So um, learning, the landscapes and seeing the landscapes, you know, way back when, like the, I think I've, I think I've told you this before, but uh, the original, I had a friend who restored um, fine art prints, original fine art prints. So she restored an original Ansel Adams eight by 10 contact print of the golden gate before there was a golden gate. Mm. And um, it like the whole story about how she, cleared the black off I think it was oxidation and just what she eventually what eventually worked was so simple and surprising but the print I held that print and you know you could see every single detail nothing was distorted of course because it's a contact print right on glass and so there is no distortion because that's your you know that's your that's your print right there so it was just really the historic part of it the adventure part of it, the love, the, just the sheer love of nature that Ansel Adams had in his, in his appetite and, you know, desire to, to uh, preserve it and honor it and doing it all in black and white so you could really see the bones of, of nature and the light and the shadow in the purest form. Ditto Edward Weston, but the way he saw was all the design features so um, the design features that he did were just stunning. And then the, the prints on silver gelatin and the albumin, uh, you know, um, types of prints. And then minor white with his light and shadow. You just, if you ever want to give yourself an education in those forms, go check those people out because they were just freaking amazing. Um, and they informed, you know, my style of photography. And then later on, you know, like, just like Kenneth said, Trey Ratcliffe with the color and the HDR and all that kind of thing. And just the shades and shades of color and light and so on and so forth. But my underpinnings were way earlier than, because I'm way older. <laughs> Most people <laughs> in photography these days, it seems like, but that, but I always felt really good about, um, Paul Caponegro was another one. And some of his, in fact, I have one of his prints of the white deer running and jumping, and it's and it's a, a dragged shutter while well, it was filmed. So you know it was a little bit of a blurred exposure, and I just freaking love it. And it, it's sometimes hard to put into words. All black and white, and so gorgeous. 
So that was my background. Uh, let's see. So the next question I have, let me just see if I missed anything. Um, I'm going to come, well, you know what, this one's here, and then I've got the other ones written down. So you love New York as your muse. Do you have similar feelings for someplace outside of the U.S.? I do. You well, I've, I've not um, been able to travel outside of the U.S. just yet. I had planned to last year, but then pandemic took place. Um, well, I have been to, as of right now, I've only been to the Bahamas and Canada. And so uh, as far as outside of the U.S., I would definitely put uh, Vancouver or Toronto or Edmonton, Canada. Those are three places that I really, really enjoyed that are very beautiful scenic locations. So those are probably be, as of right now, my, my sort of go-to outside of the U.S. Mine would be, well, France. I spent so much time in France and I have friends there and I love shooting there, but Italy, uh, outside of the U S yeah. So for landscaping you know, the Italian Dolomites are just drop dead. Incredible Venice. How can you go wrong in Venice? <laughs> so like I said earlier, what I mentioned our artist voice, Venice and the Dolomites, it was so dramatically different. It was really fun to, to work on your, you know, an artistic voice approach with such dramatically differing types of subject matter, Venice, Italian Dolomites, and the different lifestyles, you know, that each one calls for. It was really fun and it was really a challenge. And um, like I said before, Slovenia, I did go to Slovenia to make a film, um, which was, uh, we did with Smug Mug. And I just fell in love with Slovenia and I can't wait to go back. And after the pandemic, I will. And uh, those are my favorite places thus far outside of the U.S. Okay, hello from Paris. Hello, Paris. <laughs> Love Paris. Okay, uh, another question. When did you realize you were gonna be a photographer, photographer full-time? Never did. It was my high school economics teacher that sort of implanted that into me. Because I never wanted to be a photographer at that point from in 2008. I just took pictures for the fun of it and for the memories. It wasn't a career or anything. That was never on the radar. So it was never something that I ever wanted to do, to be honest. I never saw photography that's far from my mind. I wanted to be meteorology and physics were areas that I was more interested in at that time. Uh, because I, I enjoyed the sciences and I enjoyed mathematics. So that's why I wanted to do something that, that kind of fused both of those areas together, where I have the science aspect, but then also have mathematics without choosing one science that doesn't have that sort of incorporation or doing mathematics specifically. So I, I thought that's what I would have been doing or something dealing with computers. You know, never in a million years did I ever see myself as doing photography. It was my teacher who felt that I was really good at this. She was the one that helped me start my business, um, who mentioned to, for me to put my work online, because up until that point, I was never online on anything. And I just took pictures for the, for the heck of it. And so it just, it really was not my, it wasn't my doing. It was not anything that I saw. It was something that my teacher saw in me that she thought that I was good at. And now professionally, this is, you know, 12, 13 years later, I'm still doing it, oddly enough. And I've always enjoyed it because, I mean, I was enjoying it for the eight years that I was just doing it for fun, just for the memories. But now I got another X amount of years on top of that. Coolio. Um, somebody asks, how long did it take to actually start making a living selling prints. I'm going to jump in on this one because personally, um, well, I don't know that any of us are making a living only selling prints. And personally, I'm not sure I would want to only do that because as an entrepreneur my whole life, I understand the value of multiple streams of income. And I enjoy doing so many things that I want selling prints to be part of that. Uh, and, you know, and, and plus, you know, the, the multiple streams of income, right, they kind of do this. 
sometimes. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if for a while it's more prints and because I do voiceovers also, and I also teach and I also write. So, you know, sometimes you're just more in the mood to do this or that. Or, so as each one of them flows, to me, it adds a lot of color and texture to life. So um, I've been selling prints personally for the last 10 years on and off, you know, haven't focused on it until the pandemic uh, or actually kind of the pandemic informed me that I wanted to focus on that. So it <laughs> took me till this year to really decide to do it. Um, so it's, it's one of those so kind of soft boot things that, you know, you, you try and then maybe you go for it at a certain point. Um, but personally, I'm a big fan of multiple streams and the entrepreneurial style of doing all of this. What do you think? I'm definitely in agreement with that because the same with me is as far as prints, because I mean, I still enjoy, you know, teaching. I, that's a big part of what I enjoy. I would not want to stop like what I'm doing with Adobe to just focus on selling prints. I would never want to do that because right. I enjoy that and being able to educate people on, you know, doing things in photography, you know, how to get the most out of the gear that they own, um, helping, you know, encourage people, inspire people and really, you know, motivate them to go forward in, in their journey in the whole artist artistry of photography. And it's, it's very accurate of what you said as far as, you know, the streams go like this. That's, mm -hmm. that's definitely the case. Because, like right now, you know, I, I don't put much emphasis on my store like I was before. But it's still, you know, it's, I don't have to really focus on it because it's always going to have money rolling through it mm -hmm. to where I can focus on other things to where, you know, I'm working on other projects and, you know, I might be, you know, working on something with Adobe one minute, or I'm working on something with Zeiss the next minute, or I'm doing something myself that's, you know, a self project that I want it to do. And I like being able to have that kind of flexibility, but then knowing that, yeah, I'm still going to have income consistently every month. You know, I have my YouTube channel, um, I have here on Instagram. So there's, there's a lot of different avenues. Um, I still teach workshops. So it's, it's a, it's a plethora of different things that's going on. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm putting this question next because it kind of relates to what we're already saying, which is speaking of the pandemic, uh, do we see that the photography market has shrunk? And by that I'm going, as the photography market is very broad. So shall we, I think you're probably saying sales prints by photography market. Is that what you mean? Because I've seen that there's more, there's been more opportunity there, not less. Yeah, for me, I, I, it's actually been more opportunity for me during the pandemic than it was before. Yeah. Because when I tell you I didn't, so I started uh, partnering with Adobe back in 2019. With who? Adobe. Adobe, okay. So this was back two years ago. During the pandemic, out of nowhere, it's sort of like I started getting a lot of projects coming with them on a consistent basis. And they've actually been like my, my biggest and best client th throughout the entire pandemic. You know, they, they literally have been there, you know, for much, just about every month since I think maybe May or June of last year. And so I'm appreciative of that. So it's, I, and I feel because, you know, we're in this sort of state where most things are online, that the fact that we're dealing with companies that, you know, are tech companies or companies in that sort of type industry where they have a massive online presence this only amplified their investment to put out more content to focus more on what they do online so there is definitely more opportunity out there yeah. so I don't feel that if, if you're someone that's specifically a an on-location photographer if you're if your business is modeled around where you're doing photo shoots, you're doing weddings, that sort of thing. Yeah, you definitely saw the, the sort of suffrage of this pandemic and probably still feeling those effects. 
to where, you know, there's not that many concerts still, there's not that many events going on still as it was pre-pandemic. But that's why, as we both have said, you know, having multiple streams is very important. So that way you don't feel those effects right. immediately, you know. Or if you might... do, you pivot, you know, you have enough going on, you can pivot quickly, you know. Right. Yeah. Because I agree, because there's a lot more online opportunity, certainly, in all the ways that Ken says. But in terms of prints, it was really interesting to, to watch it. I was, you know, I had my own issues. <laughs> so it, and it took me a while to catch up with myself and decide what I was going to do, since my, all my in-person stuff went away. And that was kind of what I was living for. Uh, so in terms of prints, though, you know, people, individual people were home. And they wanted to make their home feel good. So they were purchasing art and, you know, redoing their homes and then businesses. <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah, see, exactly. So there was, there was that level of business. And then especially sort of towards the end when things started to kind of come back, um, other businesses wanted to be able to kind of refresh, especially hospitality, um, wanted to refresh their, their look and feel for their clientele. But, you know, doing a whole remodel right after the pandemic was way too expensive. But investing in artwork was a was a way to really dramatically change the look and feel and vibe without, you know, quite the expenditure that a complete remodel would do. So there were those kinds of opportunities as well. So it was really interesting to watch the pandemic and see kind of what came and what went and where the opportunities were and so on and so forth. Just really a good question. Thank you. I am going to, um, I'm not going to go two hours. <laughs> We're actually at my time that I usually like to wrap these. So let's go another few minutes, answer another couple of questions. Um, biggest challenge as a photographer? Dealing with people. <laughs> huh? I'm sure people are probably looking for more than that, but that literally is it, dealing with people. <laughs> do you so do you think most photographers are like that really basic basically hermits and just want to do their thing and not deal with people at all no because i i kid you not i've gone to events and trade shows i got asked this last year at imaging usa in nashville um i was actually asked why are you so quiet by one of the representatives because i'm actually there as an ambassador for them <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm not, I'm really not trying to be that buddy-buddy. And some people are a little too touchy-feely for me. And I don't, I actually, that makes me nervous. And I don't like that. I don't like a lot of people. And I just don't like large, just large crowds or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, so, I get anxiety in big crowds. Oh, my God. So it always, because, so when I do certain events, I'm usually required to be at certain functions that take place during these trade shows, you know, that these social events that they have. So I'm literally just there. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to mingle because I really don't trust people. And so I'm not trying to really like get to know anyone. And some people are just, you know, can be vicious people. And I'm not trying to, you know, be amongst that because if you think I you know I don't want to to kind of sound you know full of it or anything like that but if you notice no one ever says anything bad about me online but that's because I stay to myself I don't really I don't talk to people I'm I don't want people to feel like I'm closed off or anything because I mean for instance you know of the, the the few interviews and things that I've done you know, I've, I've always agreed to do them. I've never turned down any of them, I don't think. But I'm, I'm just not out there like some of these others that you see on a consistent basis because I'm not in people's faces like that because I just, that, that brings a lot of anxiety when I'm in these big crowds or at these events and things. And so that's a, even when I do the trade shows, people usually... I might linger for a bit, but then I sometimes will disappear because I don't like a lot of people around. And even when I do the, the presentations, I'm usually not focused on the crowd. I'm usually focused on specific people that I'm comfortable with. And that's how I usually get through those presentations. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't go as well. But I just, 
yeah, people. That's that's really it. Is people. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So what? Like, okay, so to wrap up this conversation, which has been great. These have been great, great questions, and I know there's a there's a few lingering ones. I don't know if you want to grab them and answer them in DM or not, but um. So thank you all for these fantastic questions. We really appreciate it. And doing a photo book. <laughs> Wondering how this guy made me buy two Loxia lenses. That would be you, Kenneth. Maybe <laughs> for his eyes. Yeah, stay true to yourself. A lot of people have lost that. Yes, stay true to yourself. That's always my, in fact, in a, in a sentence or two, I don't know if I don't know if that's asking the moon, but in a sentence or two, what would you say your purpose is behind your photography in doing photography? Um, so I feel photography is my ministry. It's what I at the time didn't know that I was supposed to do, but I feel like it's it's what I was meant to do and as far as how I utilize it just to encourage and inspire other people. That's, yeah. I, I try to stay away from, you know, other types of content that you see online. And I always want to be that place to where people can just come and see pretty photos. Yeah. You know, you're not seeing any kind of like, I hate political stuff. I see it on online all the time. People go to the news for that type of stuff. They don't want to come on Instagram and see someone's page full of that too. So I kind of stay out of that. I don't kind of, you know, entertain any of that. There was a post that I had because uh, when I recently came back from Miami and there are some issues that I had with several places in Miami and several districts. And someone asked me about that as far as, you know, why is it, you know, you had so, so many issues with security and all that stuff. And the response that I had, I was like, I know this probably won't go over well because someone's probably going to see it and say something. But I, I just have to make the mention of it that, you know, it's the difference between a Democratic state versus Republican state or or area. And one person actually made a comment about, oh, are you really going to politicize this? No, it's not, I'm not politicizing it. I'm like, I'm telling you that as a fact. As someone who has been in this country to 44 states, I think I'm a pretty good judgment for what one area is as opposed to another. I'm not politicizing it. It's just a fact. And sometimes people have a hard time accepting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I understand you might live there, but this is how your area is. <laughs> that's, that's just a fact. Yeah. And, you know, I generally don't have the issues that I do in democratic areas or states as opposed to the Republican states. And just from the comments that I received of the people down in Miami, I'm like, that makes kind of sense. And it's not to say that, you know, I go to New York City and it's 100% perfect. No, but I just don't have the issues there that I had in Miami. Because I mean, I've walked, tell me this, why is it that a neighborhood in Miami has a tighter security and you can't take pictures there, but yet the World Trade Center is the most secured location, as well as Washington, D.C.'s and our Capitol building, the White House. Think about it. All of those are federal buildings. You know, Ground Zero is an area that they definitely monitor like, like nobody's business. But why is it that I never have a problem with our government buildings? I don't have a problem at World Trade Center. But those are supposedly our most securest locations in this country. But it's just because the demographics are different mm -hmm. as far as where you are. That's just a fact. That's just how our country is made up. So it's like, you know, sometimes people may hate to hear certain things that may be true, but like, that's just the way it is. You know, I hate to say it that way, but that's, that's how it is. Some places you're going to have an issue, some places you won't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. Well, all I can say is I think that we both are in agreement that we just, it's like you said, it's your photography is your ministry. I feel like I was here to bring in inspiration and light and awaken souls and remind people of who they really are and bring the voice of nature indoors. And uh, 
and just enliven in that way. So that's my feeling about it. And uh, thank you for doing this. I really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's always so much fun when we get together and chat. So um, you can find Kenneth. Give everybody where to find you. I am Professor Hines everywhere. So professorhines.com is my website. .net is my photo site. Professor Hines is Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Professor Hines Choice on YouTube. So everything is the same. Very easy to find me. So dig in because he's got just a, a wealth of information and wonderfulness to share. You can find me at karenhuttonart.com. Um, I'm having a little impromptu sale, 30% off all my fine art prints. And if you go down to the gift guide, you'll see the new merchandise we just put up today. Uh, only it's limited. It's all limited edition. There's only 50 of each. So go get it while the getting's good. And, uh, <laughs> yep. and then, <laughs> say what? And then people can catch me. I know you won't catch me tomorrow because I'm too I was early just for you. Say that. You're, you're up tomorrow. If you haven't had enough yet tomorrow, he's going to tell you where to find him. Yep, because I um, do my Saturday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so 5 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the, and I know people wonder why so early. So I used to do two. I used to do a morning live and an evening. The morning one is always more crowded than the evening. I don't know why that is. Isn't that interesting? So I decided to leave off the evening one and kept the morning one. You know, yeah, it's a struggle for me to be up at 8, at eight in the morning. But I said, if these people can tune in and, you know, because last week we had uh, almost 1,100 people total during that live. So I'm like, well, I'm going to keep the morning and let the yeah. evening go. Yeah. Well, it frees up your day. <laughs> right. It yeah. does. So it does. I'll be doing my um, standard Q&A where for an hour I'm answering people's photography questions about gear or whatever it may be. And, um, yeah. That's awesome. So that's uh, is that that's every Saturday, right? Yes. Every Saturday, eight a.m. Uh, Instagram live. Go get it, Professor Hines. Professor Hines, you rock as always. Thank you. You as well, KH. <laughs> We're both KHs. We love that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. You have a fantastic weekend, and I'll be talking to you soon. Sounds great. Okay. Bye, guys.